This is uh, the Charter School of Wilmington, Team 3015 from Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, here's the first question of the Moody's Mega Math Challenge. Tell us your name. All right, so my name is Byron Fenn, and I'm a senior at the Charter School of Wilmington. My name is Chris Dang, and I'm a senior at the Charter School of Wilmington. My name is Martin Curry, and I'm a senior as well. My name is Kyle Lennon, and I'm also a senior. My name is Stephen Burkett, and I'm also a senior. Welcome to the Moody's Mega Math Challenge, and you may begin. So, millions of kids each year walk into classrooms just like this one here, and they come in with the dream of receiving a successful education that will lead them to success later on in life. Yet an important but often overlooked factor of promoting success with kids is actually not something that exists within this classroom, but in the school cafeteria, and that comes in the form of a healthy, proper, and nutritious, nutritious lunch. But how can we actually successfully implement a better, more nutritious lunch? And so this is the problem that we have worked to solve over three different parts of our solution. And in the first part of our solution, we looked at how to model the number of calories a student would need at lunch based on his or her personal attributes. And so that the way we built this model was akin to almost building a layer cake, where we um, looked at many different variables that built up upon each other. And so the first layer that we looked at was the baseline metabolic rate that applies for each student. And so for, for, for the BMR, this, um, this is the number of calories a student would need to apply normal um, body processes such as breathing and pumping of the heart. And we found that a simple way to model this is that it is proportional to 10 times the body weight of a student. We next looked at um, calories that are burned through non-normal processes such as physical activity levels. And so what we found is that um, the calories burned by physical activity depend on two different factors one being the level of phys physical activity, which we categorized as low, moderate, or vigorous, and then the weight, of, um, the weight of the student. And so we found that we could calculate how many calories are burned by physical activity by creating coefficient values for each different level, which we found based on studies from the U USDA and other um, medical studies. And then we can multiply that by the weight of the student to find how many calories are burned by physical activity, which we then added to the baseline metabolic rate. And then we next looked at a factor that is probably familiar to most of us students here, which is sleep deprivation. And so what we found from our studies was that um, sleep loss can actually increase the amount of calories that a student needs during the course of the, course of the day. And so we were actually able to fit a logarithmic submodel for this part, which shows how as sleep loss increases, the amount of calories that a student needs over the day also increases. So we were able to multiply this by the previous part, and then that would show what the effect of sleep deprivation is on the amount of calories a student would need over the course of the day. Next, we had to adjust for age, since obviously um, a student who is 18 years old has different caloric needs than a student who is 14 years old. And so what we found is that for our model to remain accurate, we had to somehow depress the effect of the increasing weight of the student compared to the increase in calories they need since that slowed compared to how much they were increasing in weight. And so we found that we were able to fit um, a decaying model that would be multiplied by the previous part to show um, the decaying um, amount of calories a student needed based on their age. And then we had to adjust for whether a student was male or female, since we found from literature that male, males and females have different caloric needs. And from, from some studies, we saw that um, females, on average, have a metabolic rate which is 90% that of males. So to account for this, we created a binary condition where if a student was a male, we would multiply um, our previous layers by 1. If they were a female student, however, we would multiply that by 0 0.9 to account for the 90% metabolic rate. And then we next accounted for um, whether a student ate breakfast or not. So from literature, we found that st um, students on average, their breakfast should consist of one-fourth of their daily calorie needs. So we created another condition where if a student did not eat breakfast, he or she would need to make up these calories lost at lunch. So that means if a, uh, um, so we realized that um, for this part, it was only a binary condition where we, which we created, but we realized in the future we can further improve this by accounting for the quality of the breakfast a student ate, because obviously some students may eat breakfast, but it may only be a small a portion which does not meet the 25% of the calories that they need. And then we next looked at the current um, body mass index of the student compared to the target body mass index, which indicates a healthy level. And so the way we did this is that um, 
with our model, we wanted to apply pressure to push students towards a healthy range. And so, for example, if a student was above a healthy body mass index, such as at a BMI of 20, whereas he should have been at a BMI of 17, our model would account for this and reduce his calories slightly at lunch, so gradually over time, he would be pushed to a healthy level. And then, putting all these factors together, that's what our final model looked at. However, we needed a way to test our model to see whether it was actually accurate or not. And so the way we did this is that we looked at um, values from the USDA guidelines based on how, much, how many calories a student should get at lunch, and we compared these to the um, values that our model outputted. And so we found that on average, our model was within 8% of these um, gu guidelines almost all the time showing that our model is accurate. We created residual plots to the right here that show um, the difference between our predicted values and the values that should be, that the USDA recommends. And we found that there was no obvious pattern showing that our model can be feasible um, the way it's being used. And then we next performed sensitivity analysis, which we thought was important, because obviously we don't want small changes in our inputs to have a huge change in the output, because if there's huge changes in the outputs, that means a student could get a lot less calories at lunch than they actually need. And what we found that is that even if we do change um, some input, such as the BMI of a student by large quantities, the overall output is not changed too much, showing our model is not too sensitive. All right. So now we've reached the second part of the problem. Uh, okay. So one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Well, from the first part of our solution, we determined the factors that influence caloric needs at lunch, and from there we created the model uh, for the distribution of U.S. high school students in the U.S. for each model. So. And that is our model. So how did we get that? So to tackle this problem, we first imagined a map of the US. Now kids of all sorts of combinations of factors of caloric needs are spread out. So it's important to note that for this problem, it's not just about meeting the needs of an average student. No, it's about meeting the caloric needs of each specific individual and making sure that our model works for everyone. All right, so to uh, make this problem easier to deal with, we made some assumptions in that the distribution is just a percentage of the US high school students. All right. And then since we also assumed that the grade level, well, the size of each grade level in each high school was the same, so the age itself had no direct impact on our model. And then furthermore, since height and weight are directly related to BMI, we decided not to include them in our model since we would consider that redundant. Then from our data for in terms of age and BMI curves, we actually found them to be normally distributed. So we can actually use a range of z-scores uh, as the percentage of high school students in terms of BMI. And we also finally assumed that uh, many of our uh, factors would be considered independent of one another, and that the ratio of male to females would be one to one. Uh, so overall, this all breaks down our model into simply just multiplying all of the factors together. And so uh, the strength in this model is that it's very simple, you know. Uh, but the only problem is that it's heavily reliant on the viability of model from our first part of our solution. So we advise the use of this model more as a general guideline for the distribution. Our, our next task was to find the amount of the total population that we covered under our model um, for an 850 calorie lunch plan. Since we'd broken it up into demographics in the previous part of part two, we decided was to stick with this approach and find the coverage within these demographics. So a demographic is a combination of these discrete variables, a unique combination of them. Um, and in, within a demographic, there are a few variables that are continuous, such as BMI, height, and weight. But since these variables are related to each other, we could rewrite them in terms of only two, BMI and height, which would yield to simpler comparisons. So within each demographic, we began with low BMIs and ran our part one model for a range of heights. We used that to find the maximum height for uh, a student that would be covered under 850 calories. Then comparing that to height distribution charts with age and um, gender, we could find the percentile that that height coordinates to, which is the percent of kids that would be covered at that given BMI. Running that over a range of BMIs would give us a BMI versus percent coverage curve as you see here. Um, it was a linear model we found with the slope being the same over all the demographics. However, different demographics had different intercepts. We adjusted that through a constant C which we determined for each demographic. The next part was to multiply this by a normally distributed BMI curve, which gives each BMI value a weight depending on how many students have that BMI. When you integrate this curve, you get a value of less than 100%, which would be the coverage within a given demographic. 
Finally, for determining the total coverage of the population, we would simply multiply the coverage within a demographic by the prevalence of the demographic, which we determined earlier in part two. Summing up all of these individual coverages would give us the total coverage for the population. We found that this was only about 10%, which is strikingly low, but since USDA values for uh, caloric needs for students, some for even normal students were not met under 850 calorie meal plans, and these didn't even take into account factors like sleep deprivation and skipping breakfast, which are very prevalent in the high school population, we determined that this 10% value is actually reasonable and suggests that lunch plans need to account more for caloric needs of students in the future. Coming up with a better lunch plan was what we tackled in our model in part three. So for part three, we created a lunch plan that would meet the, meet the goals of the federal government, the school districts, and still appeal to the students. So the federal government's main concern is with nutrition. We defined a healthy lunch as, or a healthy diet as one that follows the USDA's Choose My Plate guide. This provides the quantity of food in a, that a student should eat daily in order to maintain a healthy balance of calories, cholesterols, and nutrients. So um, you, every, the foods are f split into the five fruit, food groups. And then from that, we, can know, we know how much that student should eat during lunch. So now that we know how much the student should eat during lunch, we have to figure out how much it should cost to, main, to stay within the school budget. The school budget is $1.40 or $1.20. So we have to figure out the different combinations of, school, of the food groups and then figure out the individual prices of the items. So now we know the quantity. We figure out, we, we find the price per unit from the consumer price index, which will uh, give a non-biased price per unit, and then we can simply multiply them together. And then if they're in the same uh, units, then we can multiply them together. However, sometimes we have to convert from cups to pound, for example. So then multiplying those together, we can get the price per daily serving. And then we found a source that says that lunch should account for a third of the daily serving. So we can just simply divide by three to get the price per lunch serving. And this is an example using apples and bananas. All right. So now that we've got the prices, we just wanted to make sure that we were able to stay within the constraints of the school budget as given by the problem. We decided to break it down into a daily budget so that we could look at the individual meals that would be given to the students each day. With the restrictions of the budget and the guidelines by the federal government, we now needed to make sure that our, our lunch plan appealed to the students because they're the ones that buy the lunch, so without them, the lunch plan is useless. We determined that students were most interested in food that would be both desirable and variable because students want food that they enjoy and they do not want to eat the same thing every day, otherwise they'll just get sick of it. To conquer this problem, we created deliciousness values. So the way that we determined deliciousness values is we took a survey of a representative school which had approximately 1,400 kids in it. They were given the following options and we had on the survey the percentage of students that responded with each choice. Using the formula in the top right, we were able to determine how many deliciousness values each set of responses should yield. The DV multiplier was 1, 0.5, 0, negative 0.5, negative 1, and 0 respectively to account for not only the difference in the amount of deliciousness values that should be given by someone liking it a lot versus only a little, and how it should be taken away if someone doesn't even like the food. Once we were able to get all of these values, we summed them for the total deliciousness values of an individual item as shown here with the carrot sticks. Some items such as apples had apple slices and applesauce, which for those we just took the average value and just named that for apples. Once we had our total deliciousness values, we would divide that by the price for a daily serving of lunch so that we could get the amount of value that students would get based on the price of it. This value, the DVD, would take into account the price of the, the, price of the food, which would satisfy the budget, the deliciousness values to satisfy students, and keep us within the federal guidelines satisfying the government. Now that we had our DVD values, we could actually create a program to give us a lunch meal each day based on how much students wanted it per the cost. So we used the percentage of the total DVD within a food category, which would be such as grains or dairy, and we would get a percentage DVD for each item. This particular one is fruits. Once we had a percentage of the total DVD within that category, we divided it by five because there are five food categories within the federal choose my plate diagram. That number would be the weight of the item. So when we had the weight of that, we would sum all of the weights of each individual component to get the weight of the meal. 
The meal weights tended to be within 40 or 50, and the total weight for all 96 options was around 4,400. When we were given a, this was for a lunch plan with a $1.40 per day budget. When we had to decrease it to $1.20 per day, we were knocked down to about 40 options, but that still meets the variability needs in that we can still provide at least one different lunch every day. So overall, our lunch plan is able to meet the desires of the students, the federal budget, or the federal guidelines, and the school budget. On the whole, our model successfully meets the goals of Michelle Obama's Hungry Healthy Kids Act, and <clears throat> although much more work will need to be done in the future, the future deserves nothing less than the best. Thank you. Fifteen minutes flat, perfect. deprivation part of your model, so I don't know if you guys want to, or if you're able to go back to that. So for the sleep de deprivation part, you used a logarithmic function, and you cited just various sources. Yeah, um, so um, we found, uh, sorry, so we found um, on average, we found a source that says on average, um, a um, sleep loss of two hours from your um, ideal goal, since each age group has a certain range of sleep that they should meet. We found that um, on average, um, uh, the average sleep loss causes an increase in calorie inta intake by 5%. And then we found um, other sources that, that say um, an average um, of sleep loss of 3% of three hours led to an increase of 5.5%. And then we, we assumed that if there was no sleep loss, um, say it be zero hours of sleep loss, then that would not increase your caloric needs. And so we thought that the logarithmic, logarith logarithmic function would uh, fit it well because um, the first hours of sleep loss obviously um, affect you the most. However, over time, within our domain of use from zero to five hours of sleep loss, it would um, kind of level off to a certain, certain value. So we thought that the logarithmic function would model that process well. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for that answer. I, I'd like to ask another question, maybe around part of the same, um, what you describe it as, like layers of a cake? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So um, I was also wondering a little bit about the um, ideal mass deviation. Yeah. So my my, my question mm -hmm. um, was uh, I guess focused on on uh, this the very first equation there and mm -hmm. um, how did you arrive uh, how did you how did you decide to use you know, this height square there's also 22 pounds so how did okay. you arrive at that? Yeah, so um, that's kind of just like um, unit conversion because on um, BMI, the units for that is kilograms over meter squared. Mm -hmm. And so if you remember with all of our model, we're just looking at calories. So we wanted to convert this to calories, actually. So then um, to actually do that, um, recalling our first part where we talked about the baseline metabolic rate, where we said that um, the calories burned by that is proportional to 10 times the weight. So we wanted to model this with the difference in BMI. So the first step of this equation was taking the target BMI subtracted from the current BMI and that gave us the difference in BMI. And then by multiplying it by 22 pounds, so the part there is that each kilogram is 2.2 pounds. And then it, um, again, looking back to BMR where we did 10 times the weight, we again apply that similar process, so it's 10 times 2.2 to get 22. And then to cancel out the meter squared on the bottom, we multiply that by H squared, so that would leave us with the final units of calories. back to something similar to question one uh, related to your logarithmic uh, equation. In uh, section two, part two, you built up to an equation 12, uh, and it says for each successive sleep deprivation level, the percentage of students covered dropped by 20 percent. Um, this was in your paper. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. In your paper in section uh -huh. two, part two. Uh, I don't know if you recall that in the paper, but we were wondering, was that developed or derived from your model, or was that something you obtained somewhere else? Um, so, what, yeah, what we did, uh, I think that relates back to, uh, I don't know if I could find it here, but the equation was basically a linear model that had, it was like 1.089 minus 0.0114x minus c, and so c was variable based on the demographic, and like I said, sleep was one of the discrete, uh, discrete variables that would change with demographics. So somebody who gets one, one less hour of sleep than they should 
is in a different demographic than someone who gets two less hours of sleep than they should. So with our model, we, we tested it. We basically you know, put it in Excel. We ran a program that tested it a, a bunch of times, and we would determine max height coverage. And so that max height would coordinate to a percentile based on the age and the gender. And so we found that the percentile from our model dropped 20% for each successive sleep deprivation level. So that was really derived from our model. But I mean, from sources and, and everything, we found that the, since the calories dropped by a certain amount percent, and that, that percent would often coordinate to a pretty large drop since you, most of the calories for student, that students need was around 850 for lunch. So if you have a, a small increase, that could even bump them from under 850 to over 850. So we did determine it was reasonable from literature, but the 20% actual value was from our model. Yeah. Okay. One question? Yeah, one more question. Can you go back to your very first slide, the very overview first? of your model? The overview of our model? Um, yeah, the very first slide. Let's see, gosh. Let me just click on it. Yeah, that's what I uh, can you explain the thinking behind this? How did you arrive at this particular order? Yeah, so I mean, so like the whole idea with this model was building up all the factors that influence how many calories a student needs in the day. So the, the first thing is obviously just the normal processes that your body carries out, whether it be breathing, pumping of the heart. So that's what baseline metabolic rate is. And then the next thing we looked at was processes that are non-normal, which is physical activity. And so these would then be added on to the baseline metabolic rate. And then, so, um, and, then, and then I guess there's no real order for the next ones, but um, these are just other factors that we considered. So the next one that we considered was sleep deprivation and how that increases caloric needs. Then we had to account for, um, so accounting for needed for lunch only, that um, refers to our model was looking at it um, as a whole day. But then to account for lunch, we found from USDA guideline sources that lunch should account for a third of a, a student's daily calories. So then to account for that, we divided by three in our model. And then we adjusted for age and de gender, since different age kids and different genders, whether male or female, they, need different, they have different caloric needs. And then finally, we accounted for what are the effects if a student skips breakfast? How does that affect how many calories he or she would need at lunch? Yeah, but that's curious as to the particular choice that you made in all sequencing them. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.